So, let's get started. We're going to be in Acts chapter 15. We were down to verse 7. We're going to drop back to verse 6 just to kind of work our way into this. Um, Paul and Barnabas had uh, been um, sent, basically, with some other men from Antioch of um, uh, Syria, right? Antioch, and uh, had been sent to Jerusalem to go and meet with the elders there because there was a question. Remember, there was three uh, things that came up. One, circumcision for salvation, that people had to be circumcised in order to be saved. Then there was those who said they had to be circumcised to keep the law. And then there were those that said, why do we need circumcision at all? And so this was the argument that was being carried out there. Now, verse 6 says, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So this is a, it wasn't a church vote. It was asking those in leadership, those they trusted as elders and apostles, to make a decision, a doctrinal, a doctrinal decision. Remember, they didn't have this book at that time. They had portions of it, but this was not completed at that time. Paul hadn't even written any of his uh, books of the Bible yet. So uh, understand, they are, they are without the instruction book. But they have the one who gives instruction, who is the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so they could trust him. And they put their trust in those leaders to make good decisions. They knew as elders or as, as apostles that they had the ear of God. And so they said, go ask them uh, what they think. And so they come together as a group, and they begin to consider this matter. Verse 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them. Now, they were looking for an answer. The disputing, I don't think, was yelling at each other. I don't think it was taking sides. I think they were sharing with each other what their thoughts were. And they, it, was, it was a dispute, yes, in the sense of uh, there were those who believed strongly one way and others believed strongly the other way. But as I see this play out, I believe these folks had the right heart attitude as they came to this meeting. They wanted the right answer. It wasn't they wanted their answer. They wanted the right answer. They wanted to make sure that what they had heard or what they believed was the right thing. And uh, even though they had strong feelings about one or the other, <coughs> excuse me, they, uh, they had a, uh, I, they, I, you're going to see this as it's plays out. They had a heart to know what God wanted them to do. And they hadn't come there to fight to the point of a division. You know, if you don't believe like we do, we're leaving and you can just have this thing. No, that wasn't what happened at all. In fact, it's really interesting how this all came. And I'm going to tell you, when there's disputes in a church, that's the way we should come. We should come with an attitude, let's find the best answer. Let's look for the best answer. And then let's, let's agree to live by that answer. It's not my way or the highway. It's the best answer. So here's what happens. Peter, of course, is one of the main apostles, as we know. <clears throat> so Peter has listened to all the different arguments. And so he starts out and he says, Men and brethren, you know how that at, good, uh, that at a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Do you know what he's referring to there? What? The, um, Cornelius. That's exactly right. He's referring to Cornelius. The fact that the, the, the sheet came down, the Lord says, take it and eat. And he said, I don't eat anything unclean. And he's saying, he said, there was something special took place there. And we need to think about that. So argument number one is that according to God's work in the past, when God saved Cornelius and his home, it was without circumcision. You go back and read Acts chapter 10. Peter didn't say, well, I'll be glad to lead you to Christ, but first you're going to have to be circumcised. It didn't happen. Peter's preaching and they get saved. And that's the way it worked. And they received the Holy Spirit. So argument number one was remember back these Gentiles, how they got saved. Verse 8 goes on. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So the second argument is this, that 
at, at their salvation, they receive the Holy Spirit. Just as the circumcised Jews, even though they were not circumcised. Pretty good argument going here, don't you think? I mean, he's making a pretty good case. I'm sitting here thinking, all right, you know, I came here thinking, you know, well, circumcision is important because it's part of my history. And, you know, we, we, we believe in that stuff. And so, you know, that needs to be important. That needs to be included in what we do. And Peter said, I said, wait a minute. That's not what God says. It's not what God did. Now I'm having to rethink the way I think. Now then, <coughs> excuse me, verse 9. And put no difference between us us being the Jews, the circumcised, and them, the uncircumcised, purifying their hearts by faith. Argument number three, their hearts were made pure by faith without all the rituals of Judaism. So now verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? So this goes back to the law. Why do you want to put laws on these disciples that now have started living for the Lord, have given their hearts and lives. Why do you want to put uh, these, this, this bondage on them of more law, which neither, he says, I love this, neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. He said, just remember this. He said, every time you had these laws before, we didn't obey them, did we? I mean, our fathers didn't, we didn't. So, you know, hey, hello, this is the way it goes. And uh, so why should we be putting laws on them that they can't bear? So argument number four, why add law to salvation when it never has provided salvation? We are only saved by grace. Notice what he says in verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So Peter's... I. I can almost, can't you almost sense that their mouths are being shut? You know, they were, they were, well, uh, 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 um, hmm, yeah, hmm. Can't, I, can't you see that? <laughs> At least that's the way it should be. And I think it was. I think their whole attitude was changing as they listened. Verse 12, then all the multitude kept silence. There you go. What they have to say? Peter's arguments had silenced the crowd. The disputing had stopped because Peter's arguments were so right on. Uh, I mean, he was hitting it right between the eyes. So then what happens is he gives audience to Barnabas and Paul. Why? Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Let's see what Paul and Barnabas, let's hear what they have to say. They've been up around the Gentiles. They've been witnessing and starting churches. Let's hear what they have to say. They've been on these missionary trips. Let's see what they have to say. What kind of miracles and wonders have God done among the Gentiles before you write them off, make, trying to make them into Jews? So the argument of four, five is the fact of miracles and wonders that proves salvation by grace. The signs and wonders were a confirmation of the message of the apostles. So here they, so they're going to listen to what they have to say. And after, after they had held their peace, so there was no answer after these arguments, James answered. Now, let's talk about who that is. Now, one of the Jameses has been killed by Herod, right? So that's not the James we're talking about. It's the other James. But we need to find out which one that is, right? Well, the, the first one that was killed is James, the brother of John. He's one of the sons of Zebedee. This James was called James the Less. I don't know why, but he was called James the Less. He's actually a half-brother of Jesus. And um, he, is, uh, he wrote the book of James. And he was the pastor we feel like he was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He was the main or the head pastor, the lead pastor for the church at Jerusalem. So he carried a little clout too, didn't he? So here's James now, and he stands up. After Paul and Barnabas had finished telling about all their exploits and how the Gentiles were being saved and uh, they weren't being, bad, weren't being circumcised, but uh, he, he continues. And so now he says, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, which is Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, Cornelius, to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, 
So now then, he's going to go back to the Old Testament, the, the scriptures that they have, and he said the prophets of old talked about this very thing, that the Gentiles were going to be saved. And so he quotes from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. It says, verse 16, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the, the residue of men, the rest of men, might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, whom doeth all these things. So he takes them right back to the Scriptures now, and he says, look at what the Bible says. Look what God's Word says. The prophet Amos, this is what he said. He said, whenever God comes to rebuild the earth, and he's ready to set up his millennial kingdom, notice this, he said, that the rest of the men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, prophecy proves the Gentiles will be saved without having to be proselyted into Judaism. They are the ones who call, they, upon whom my name is called. He didn't say they became Jews. He said they called upon my name. And that's what we find in the New Testament, isn't it? Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that what it says? And that's exactly what uh, James is talking about here. And what Amos was talking about in his prophecy. I'm sure this was confusing. I was just finished Amos. And I'm sure this might have been confusing to, to Amos as he talks about the Gentiles. But because he's, he's a Jew from Judea going to Israel to preach to them about the coming Messiah. And uh, then he's, he, God in this, in this inspiration of the scripture, the Holy Spirit prompts him to add about these Gentiles. I just have a feeling that maybe as a Jewish prophet, he might have, might have stumbled at his words a little bit when he first said that. But he got it out. The Gentiles, whom my name is called, that salvation without works, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. They will accomplish all these things, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the ruins of Jerusalem, establishing the Lord's kingdom. They'll all be a part of that, is what the Lord is saying there. Verse 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. That's a great place to go for... Uh, Right here, I got it. Um, for any preacher, the sovereignty of God. I love the sovereignty of God. I love the fact that God's in control of everything. Amen. Whenever things are going bad and I can't figure out anything else, I always go back to the sovereignty of God. I go back, well, God's still in charge. God's still on the throne. I don't like what's going on, but God's still on the throne. He knows what he's doing. I don't have to know. It's okay. I have faith that my God is big enough to change anything he wants to. And if he chooses not to change anything, I'm, I'm sure that God has it all figured out. I don't have to have it figured out. And that's what he says. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God hasn't made a mistake. God didn't make a mistake in the Gentiles being saved. God didn't make a mistake in overriding the circumcision that was so important to the Jews. God hasn't made a mistake with Paul and Barnabas going to the Gentiles. God has not made a mistake. He's still in control. Now then, verse 19. Wherefore, when you see the word wherefore or therefore, what's it saying? Based upon what we've just learned, based upon what you've just heard, my sentence is... That we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. These are those that are saved. Why would we trouble them with a bunch of rules and regulations from, uh, from us to them who have been saved? New Christians beginning to walk with the Lord. Excited. Gentiles. The Gentiles, of course, were the, the heathens. They were idol worshipers. They didn't, they didn't know the one true God. And now all of a sudden they know the one true God and he's their savior. And they're excited over their salvation. And all of a sudden you want to come along and put a bunch of rules on them? Now, I'll be honest with you. New Christians like rules. Do you know that? New Christians like rules. Because they can, they, can, they can weigh out or they can see their spirituality with the rules. If you give me a rule and I obey it, then that means I'm spiritual. I'm, I've got this going in the right direction. But true spirituality comes when you don't have to have the rules and you live right. Amen? That's where true spirituality is. Right. And so here these, he says, let's not put, let's not trouble them, which are Gentiles. After hearing the discussion and the arguments of Peter, Paul, Barnabas, 
He provides the godly wisdom of leadership, the counsel to a decision. Wherefore, he says, this is my sentence. This is my decision. Now then, so what should we do, James? But that we write unto them, the Gentiles, that one, they abstain from pollution of idols. That's what they came out of. Don't go back to what you came out of. Don't go back to worshiping idols. That's good advice. And from fornication. That's good advice for the Jew or the Gentile. Amen. That's good advice for a Christian. Don't go back to that old fornication. Don't go back to sexual sins. Number three, from things strangled and from blood. Again, these are things that as Christians, not to, so that they maintain their witness to stay away from these things. These were things that would paganize the church if they brought them into the church. We should Christianize the pagan and not the other way around. Don't bring the world into the church. Don't bring the lostness into the church. Carry the church to the lost. That's what we're to do. By Christian Gentiles abiding to these, it would help it not to be offensive to these Jewish Christians. They are brothers with the Jewish Christians as well as the Gentile Christians. They are combined. He says, And Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, the law of Moses, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So they're going to hear the law. They're going to get that. But let's not, let's not put any more bondage on them. So James says, let's issue this letter. Now verse 22 then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church. These were the people that were disputing earlier. I tell you, church is a great place for us to be able to share ideas. But when it comes to the place of division, we've moved way too far from where God would want us to go. There's nothing wrong with sharing our opinions and our, our thoughts. Nothing wrong with sharing our ideas. Nothing wrong with disputing in that sense. But in the end, we come together as a whole. Amen. We are a family, amen? That's right. I've said this before. Families don't always get along. I have four brothers. I had two older brothers and one younger brother. And I'm going to tell you, we didn't always get along. My older brothers didn't want anything to do with us younger brothers. But we were still brothers. My little brother, I didn't want anything to do with him. He was my little brother. I didn't want him tagging along. But he was still my brother. At the end of the day, when we sat around the kitchen table to eat supper, we were one. And I'll tell you what, when you're in a church, you're a part of a family. We're part, we, we may not always agree. But you know what? It doesn't mean we ought to run off and leave. It doesn't mean we ought to divide and split. It means we ought to work together. Find the common cause. To find the common denominator that makes us work together as one. That's what God wants. That's the witness the church should have in the world today. It's a shame the church doesn't have that witness. Most churches are known for their fighting. You know? Especially little old country churches. They, they get a bad rap because everybody, in the, everybody around them knows what's going on in the church. You know? It's amazing how many people know what's happening at Riverside Baptist Church. But, it's, but we've, we've got to stay together as a church family. And I tell you, we've, uh, right now with all our folks spread out and we don't get to see all of them all the time. Listen, they're still family. Amen? They're still part of us. And we still love them. And hopefully they'll be back with us before long. But that's part of being a family. Um, the whole church. So this then pleased at the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company. That was to provide confirmation to the decision that was being made. They were going to be sent back to the church at Antioch. With Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas. Now, we know something about Silas because Silas has become 
Paul's running mate in the next missionary journey. But Judas, or Barsabas, this is all we know about him. And that's okay, isn't it? Let me tell you something. This is cool. When you're reading the Bible, and you come across a name that there's no other information about, understand this. God thought it important to include that name in the inspired Word of God. Amen. He didn't put my name in there. <laughs> but He put Judas, surnamed Barsabas, in there. And that's all we know about him. But that's okay, because it was important that God included him in the Scriptures. But we do know about Silas, because Silas later is a co-worker with Paul in the second missionary journey. And then not only was these sent, also chief men among the brethren. These were the spiritually prominent men of the church there at Jerusalem, and they were to go with them. This added to the... Uh, the uh, the affirmation or the confirmation to the decision that was made. This was not a small decision. This has become a real point of contention up in the northern parts where the Gentiles live and uh, among the Jews there and among the Gentiles. They're arguing this thing back and forth and they're saying, well, let's make sure they know that this is exactly what we want. And so they wrote letters by them after this manner. Now here's the letter. This is it. We're going to read it. This is from the church at Jerusalem, from the apostles and the elders and the brethren there at Jerusalem. He says, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren. These are the Gentiles in the northern areas. These are Gentiles, basically Gentiles, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. So this is all in that area up north of uh, Antioch where Paul had been and they had led many to Christ. And he says, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So they're sending word of, here's these guys that have been up there teaching them that they had to do this. And all of a sudden they're going to get a letter from the home church, from Jerusalem, from these elders and apostles saying, we didn't send them up there to teach you that. Boy, they're going to have egg on their face. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's going to be, they're going to get caught uh, with their false teaching because they weren't sent there to do that. And uh, they're going to be exposed. But the brethren from the church of Jerusalem, the elders, the apostles, the brethren there, they said, we didn't send them. They may have come from us, but we didn't send them with that commandment. They had no authority to do that. Verse 25. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. Boy, I just love that. I just, got, I, I, I just love the fact that these men who came from all these areas came to Jerusalem looking for an answer and they worked together to find the right answer and they, and, and they worked with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved. And again, that word speaks volumes to those who've questioned Paul and Barnabas. Remember last week we talked about that, that here Paul was, we would never question Paul. He was the apostle who wrote most of the New Testament. Why, why Paul said it, we would believe it, right? I mean, that's just the way it was. But this was Paul before he became the apostle that wrote all the New Testament. And they were questioning him. This just didn't sound right. It wasn't what they believed. But here they attach beloved to Barnabas and Paul. They're talking about, they, these, these are men that we honor. Verse 26. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. What made these preachers do what they did? What made them, what made them carry the gospel in these places where they were beaten, where they were left for dead, where they were stoned? What made them do that? What made Paul do that? You know, it's interesting when you think about great men do great things, not because they're programmed to, it's because it's in their DNA. It's something about them. They do that. Paul, Paul, when he got saved, he, he sold out for Jesus Christ and nothing could stop him. He wasn't going to let anything keep him from being a man who was seeking after the knowledge of God, that's what he says in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his sufferings. Paul said, I want to know him. I haven't attained it yet. I'm going to continue. He was never satisfied with his Christian walk. He was never satisfied that he had come to a place of maturity. 
And if you're going to be a child of God that, that is an influencer for the cause of Christ, you have to have that kind of attitude. That just nothing will stop you. You're not going to be satisfied with just what I can give you. You're not going to be satisfied with just what you get from a Sunday school lesson. You're not going to be satisfied with just a, an hour in the mornings. You're going to always be hungry for more and for more and more until you step into glory and all of a sudden you then are fulfilled. Amen? Boy, we will be fulfilled then. Man, oh man. So he said, uh, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. One, that you obtain from the meats offered to idols. Don't go back. And from blood and from things strangled. Again, this is part of, uh, part of what their worship was like. And from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare you well. Now notice this. He doesn't say, for if you keep this, you shall be saved, does he? No, because it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. <coughs> you shall do well. You will live the way God wants you. You will be a witness. That means you will, you will not hinder the salvation story. You will be able to share with those others that are lost around you. If you maintain these good things. I go back to, uh, was it Sunday night, I guess. Yeah, it had to be Sunday night because I didn't preach Sunday morning. We talked about the holiness of God and that we really, as God's children, we, we don't put enough emphasis on living holy lives. We, we're satisfied. Many of us are satisfied with just getting by. You know, I, I remember a fellow one time told me, he said, Brother Jim, he said, I don't know why you're worried about anything. He said, I'm a lot better than a lot of people I go to church with. You know, if that's your standard, your standard is way too low. You know, the Lord says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, that he wants to conform us to the image of his son. That's our model. Jesus Christ. Now then, when you put that model up there, tell me how well we're doing. Amen? I may think I'm doing better than old Joe Blow over here, but all of a sudden I've got to look at Jesus and I realize I'm way far from being like Jesus. I've got a long ways to go. But you know what? I need, to, I need to allow the Holy Spirit, I need to allow God to work in those areas of my life so that I can be holy. I can be without sin. Verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. I imagine they were ready to hear. And again, I, I, I have to tell you this. You've got a bunch of people that have been sitting up here waiting for them to come back. It's been, you know, a pretty good while. I'm sure it's been weeks that they've been gone. And during those weeks, the conversation has not stopped. You know, the people that have been promoting that they need to be circumcised to keep the law, uh, circumcised to be saved. They've been going on. They've been continuing. And the others are going, wait a minute. Paul said we didn't have to. Paul said, well, you just wait and see. You just wait and see. When the letter comes, you'll see. But watch what happens. This is cool. Which when they had read, verse 31, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They preached salvation by grace. And salvation by grace frees the spirit of man to worship and to rejoice freely. And that's what happens here. Whenever they said, it's not about the law. It's not about circumstances. It's not about keeping the law. It's the fact that you're saved by grace. It freed them up immediately then to rejoice for the consolation. To, to rejoice over the fact that this was what had come from the church at Jerusalem. They had come from those who they knew they could trust. And then Judas and Silas, this is kind of interesting. I like what one of the commentators said. These guys must have been some pretty good preachers. You know, Paul and Barnabas, they've read the letter. But now they get up and it says, being prophets also themselves... They exhorted the brethren. They encouraged the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Hello. 
You are saved by grace, they would preach. I, could, I, would have been, I, I think it would been interesting to hear the message, the sermon they preached. It probably was a simple salvation message that just spoke of the truth of our salvation by grace and not works. And after they tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. In peace. There was no more fighting. There wasn't any uh, somebody saying, well, I'll tell you what, you don't believe like me. I'll tell you this is what I'm... No, it wasn't any of that stuff. They let them go in peace and they went back to Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. So Silas then stays. He liked what he saw. Amen. Silas had come from Jerusalem. He'd come from the Jews and from what had happened at, at, at Jerusalem, which was exciting stuff. I mean, he just came out of Pentecost. The church has been growing and lots of people are, are getting saved and things are happening. Of course, there's a lot of persecution going on there too. But now he comes up north and there's a new kind of evangelism going on because it's to the Gentiles. They don't have to deal with, well, what about circumcision? Don't have to deal with that. Don't have to, it's just a matter of sharing the gospel with them and they're getting saved. And old Silas says, man, I, I want some more of this. I want to hear some more of this. I want to be a part of this. And so he decides to stay. Paul also and Barnabas continued to Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Hey, I want to ask you a question. I need your response. Y'all been sitting here kind of quiet and I'm not getting a lot of amens out of you. Uh, so let me get you to participate for a second. Teaching and preaching the Word of God. What's the difference? Nothing? Huh? The spelling. The spelling? <laughs> teaching and preaching. Preaching, uh, preaching salvation. Teaching is teaching the Scripture. Amen. Preaching can be topical. Yeah, preaching can be topical. Teaching would be Word. 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 Amen. Amen. All right, teaching they can participate. Preaching usually you're you, you're quiet. Preaching is evangelistic. Preaching is evangelistic. Amen. Usually is. All right. Let me. Uh, I feel like I'm a preacher teacher. I feel like I do both. Yes. Uh, and and I and I when I on Sunday mornings is different than Sunday night and Wednesday night, isn't it? Right. What's the difference? Yeah. I do what. I don't let you talk back. You're, you're looking for a certain response when you preach. Preach, yeah. That's true, that's true. I thought that you're looking for a certain response. Uh, but there's a difference. I know that for me, preparation for preaching um, is extensive. It really takes a lot of time for me to put together a sermon. I've got to, I've got to read a text and I've got to, I've got to decide, I've got to feel what, or I have to, uh, not feel, but I have to see the outline that God has there for us. And then I have to put it in some kind of format to where I can expound upon those particular texts. When I'm teaching, I'm just taking you through the scriptures. I'm just giving you what's there. And I'm just kind of laying out some things for you to think about. But it's, it's, there's a complete difference. I love them both. But I really like teaching. <laughs> I like preaching. It's a little more work, it seems like, than teaching. But uh, because I'm looking for an outline, I'm always looking for an outline. Uh, whereas when I'm teaching, it's just taking the word of God and just giving it. I like the idea uh, that uh, James said, uh, preaching tends to be more evangelistic. It tends to be, and like Jasmine said, we're looking for a particular response. There's a response that we're looking for. It's crazy though, when you preach, you hardly ever get the response. It's always different than what you planned. I prepare a message and I'm thinking, boy, this will be great for somebody that really needs to learn how to pray. And then people come out of the back of the church and I go, preacher, you saved my marriage this morning. <laughs> I, I didn't even preach on marriage, you know. <laughs> you know, you go, but again, isn't that what the word of God is? It's live and living and it's important. And I think that's why I like the teaching part of it, because it really lets us let the word of God just speak to us. And I love that, too. You know, it's not so much the other preaching and teaching. I, I think there is a, a bit of a difference, but he was doing, they were doing both, and that's what God has called us to do, to preach and to teach the Word of God. And hopefully every church is doing that. That's what we need to be doing. We need to work at that to make sure we are doing that. So you preach and teach the Word of God. And see how they do. Uh, every city. No, I'm sorry. Where am I at? Teaching and preaching, verse uh, 35, the Word of the Lord. 
with many others also. So it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas. There was a bunch of them. Boy, they must have had a preaching meeting up there. You know, uh, in verse 36, And some days, some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city. So this is the beginning of the second missionary journey. This is the thought process. Paul says, I need to go check on these guys. I want to go check up on them and see how they're doing, plus reach some other areas. And so uh, this is that biblical evangelism, going out, reaching out, reaching out to the lost and carrying it on. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, I wrote out, it says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in, the, in Christ Jesus. And he wants to make sure that that has been done and is continuing to be done there. Now, verse 37, And Barnabas, who's the encourager, determined to take with him John, who's called Mark. Surname was Mark. John Mark. We've met him once before. He started off in the first missionary journey, but turned around and went home. And uh, didn't, I don't think we caught the fact that Paul kind of got upset about that. John Mark says he wanted to go. Paul said, yeah, you can go. They take him with them. They get, half, well, they get, they get off just a little ways, and before long, he says, I'm going to go home. And he turns around and goes home. But look what happens. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. He said, I want to take somebody that's going to be quitting on us. Why would I want to take a quitter? It's a pretty good point, isn't it? You know, when you're going to be doing something for the Lord's work, you don't want to take somebody that's going to be a quitter on you. I don't even want to take somebody that's going to be negative, do you? I mean, I don't want somebody going, well, it's too hard, it's too hot, I don't think I want to do that. I want somebody that's going to be an encourager like Barnabas is. But Barnabas wants to bring him, and he's related to Mark, we found out. Um, he's either a nephew or he's related somehow to him. And uh, so... Um, Barnabas would love to take him. Well, uh, he didn't want, Paul said no. Verse 39, and the contention was so sharp. Whoa, well, hello. Man, I'm going, wait a minute. Paul and Barnabas, well, they're fighting over this. Contention. That's a fight, isn't it? That's pretty strong. They, it was strong enough to where they're ready to split ways. They're ready to go different directions. Now, I said before, the church ought to stay together. The church, But understand this. Do you know what happened at Jerusalem? They split up. Why? Because of the persecution. And I'm going different directions. I'm not going to stay here and take this from these Jews here. We're getting out of here. And they left. But you know what they were doing? They were doing exactly what God wanted to do. God, God caused the persecution so the church would spread. Do you know what's happening right here? God is allowing this contention between Paul and Barnabas because Paul, God knows that Barnabas is going to take Mark and carry him off to another mission field while Paul is going to go to another field. He's splitting them apart. He's making, instead of one uh, mission team, he's making two. He's going to be able to do twice as much work. There's nothing wrong with splitting every once in a while. Sunday school classes. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's a good thing because then you can cover twice as much, do twice as much. And this is what's going to happen here. Watch and see what happens. And the contention was very sharp. Who was right? Who did God, who, who was God, who's, who's on God's side? Well, between them that they departed asunder, they split up. One from the other. Two new teams covering twice as much territory. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Now, wait a minute. If you go back and look at the first missionary journey, where was the first place they went? Cyprus. Cyprus. So Paul says, let's go back and see the brethren. And guess where Paul was planning probably to go? Cyprus. But Barnabas says, come on, Mark, we're going to Cyprus. Paul's going, wait, that's where we were going. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo, you know. <laughs> and here they go. So uh, I, I think the split takes place because God wants Paul to move to another area. He's taking Barnabas and Mark. And we know, listen, let me just finish the story. We won't find it here. But we know that in the end of Paul's life, he calls for Mark because he said he's an encouragement to him. There was a rift at this point, but it's healed sometime during this, the ministry that Paul does and Mark does. And there's a, there's a coming together and they come back together. And uh, Mark becomes valuable to Paul as a co-laborer uh, with Paul. Now then, uh, where am I at? 40, thank you. And Paul chose Silas, the prophet, a Jew, a Roman citizen, by the way. Same beliefs as Paul. 
um, I'm trying to read my right, confirmed salvation of the Gentiles. He was sent to do that. And so he was a right fit, and he departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Well, sure he was. Uh, they're sending him off again. They, they like what they heard from the mission uh, uh, conference they had. They like what they heard. It sounds great. And now that they've got the go-ahead from the church at Jerusalem to win these Gentiles to Christ and not worry about their circumcision, they said, man, let's send them out again. Let's go get some more. And so they send them out. The brethren do there, verse 41, and he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. So he went the northern route. He didn't go to Cyprus, but he went up the northern route. And this is where he goes into his second, starting of his second missionary journey. And we'll pick up that, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Ooh, it's good stuff. All right. Any question, comment, or thought? No? How did Jesus have a half-brother? Well, because Jesus is, was, was born of God and Mary. Oh, that's why and they were born of Joseph and Mary. So that's why they say his half-brother. <laughs> when you asked that, I had that. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Half-brother. All right, anybody else? Good question. There's no bad question. There can be bad answers because I'm giving them, but uh, good questions. All right, well, then let's stand. Be dismissed with a prayer. Make sure and uh, clean your spot as we go, and uh, we'll meet together Sunday. Choir practice after the service. Uh, Brother Jim is taking over. If you sing in the choir, please come and encourage him by coming and being a part of that. Uh, I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised at his abilities, and uh, I think he's going to do a great job, but he can't do it if he doesn't have a choir. And so uh, I told him, I said, you may have a quartet, but we'll call it a choir. But uh, if you'll That's stay. Social huh? That's social distancing. Yeah, social distancing. So, uh, but we'll, but uh, please stay and, and help if you're in the choir and uh, we'll have a great time. That'd be great to have a choir Sunday, right? We're going to have a choir Sunday? Yep. Yeah, cool. That'd be awesome. Amen. Well, let's pray then, okay? Father, thank you again for this day. I pray, Lord, you'll bless now. The things we've heard, let us, Father, be excited over the opportunities you give us every day to be a witness, to be an uh, encourager, to be, Father, a, um, um, just an ambassador for you wherever we are. Thank you, Lord, for our church. I pray, Father, for all of our church family that you'll bring us back together soon and that we'll be able to function together the way we were before and reaching people and loving on our kids and doing all the things we do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, next Wednesday we're having the children's program. So that's next Wednesday.